I just turned it on. Tonight, 
is night number one of six. So there's five more Wednesday nights after this one before we uh, hit the breaks for two weeks. So we do six weeks in a row. Then we hit 4th of July, which happens to be on a Wednesday. And I'm pretty sure most people won't show up. So, <laughs> so there's, no, there's no study on that night. The next week we have UW Sports Ministry here that whole week in the evening. And so I'll be busy with that. And so I will not be available to teach that week. So we have two weeks off. Then we have two weeks on. Then we have one week off for BBS and two more weeks on. And we're done August 15th. So just so that uh, you can keep that straight. The nice thing is we start off, we have six weeks in a row. Okay, no interruptions. So next Wednesday night, just plan to be here. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll go right on through. So again, there's just some minor things as far as... Um, uh, the changes between the second and third edition and uh, when I go to the third edition for instance next week when we talk about uh, sentences and paragraphs there's uh, a letter and there's a guy named Kevin in it and yada 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 that's all in your third edition the second one there is a nondescript person so they gave the name of the, the other one all right so nothing really major nothing nothing that will really uh, mess you up uh, at all all right so and we'll see who pays the least. So we'll extend it one more week. So see what you can pay. <laughs> now, here's the thing. We're going to include shipping. Right? We've got to include, we gotta include shipping. So that's very important. All right? Okay. The way we'll work this, uh, this study is that we will be going through the text. And so you will want to get a text. If you don't have a text, uh, it would be helpful for you to have a notepad uh, so that you can take, uh, take notes. Um, but uh, I do encourage you to, uh, to get a, a book if you can all do it. Um, it will be very helpful, and it will be something that you'll go back to. Uh, and it's a wonderful tool, uh, truly is for training. And uh, as you train others who will come along behind you, uh, it really will be a blessing and a benefit. So you can really benefit the body of Christ by taking this course and uh, being able to teach others with the information that you glean from it. Uh, we are doing the first three parts this summer. Part four and part five uh, is how we apply the tools that we're learning here for each one of the venues of scripture. So it's really kind of cool. So we're going to get these basic tools, uh, and we're going to put those tools in our toolbox, and we're going to be able to interpret Scripture uh, clearly and, and, and in the correct manner. And then we're going to be able to apply it. And that's where it gets really a lot to be a lot of fun. You're going to apply Scripture differently in the Old Testament, aren't you? So we're going to look at how do you apply what we've learned to the Pentateuch? How do we apply it to the wisdom books? What are the wisdom books? Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, right? Uh, on and on. Uh, we're going to apply it to the minor prophets, major prophets. We're going to apply it to the Psalms. Okay, So all of those things are very important. How do we apply these truths of Scripture? And I hope tonight I'll have time. I'm going to uh, kind of maybe touch on one just to give you a little bit of taste of what we'll do. And then you get into the New Testament. You look at the Gospels. How do we, how do we interpret kingdom passages, for instance? How do we interpret that? A lot of people get sideways trying to interpret passages in Matthew, and they apply them for today, and they translate them into to today's living, when in fact there are promises for the kingdom, and the way of kingdom is yet to come, it's yet future. And so you can really get sideways on your interpretation, and so you've got to be careful with that. You've got to be able to look at Acts. Acts is a transitional book. It is breaks all the rules. You know, I mean, you're, you're going to Acts. Then you go into the epistles, Pauline epistles, and so forth. You get into Revelation. How do we apply these things, especially when we get to Revelation, right? So that's all next summer, and that'll be fun. So uh, uh, be a student, and uh, as we go through this, um, I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, I had a lot of fun myself, and so I'm just hoping I'm not the only one that's having fun. You know, <laughs> that happens sometimes. You know, you get these professors, and they think they're, you know, this is the best stuff in the world, and nobody else really thinks so. That's really a bad place to be. So, uh, so if you're really bored and, and you're thinking to yourself, he is just really liking this material way more than I am. Uh, you know, shoot me an email and, and tell me maybe to pass out some candy or do something, uh, uh, interject some kind of joke or something at some point to make it more palatable. Uh, but I, all seriousness aside, I, all seriousness aside, you heard me. Right. <laughs> um, 
we're, we're going to have, uh, I believe, a good time as we're, as we're able to learn um, the laws and rules of interpretation and how they apply. Uh, this is really a different type of presentation. Uh, if you've been um, you know, around this type of teaching material, this is different. It really is. It's a flavor all its own. Uh, I believe it's, it's exciting, and I believe the way it's presented, you'll be able to tell that you're learning things. You're going to walk away after a Wednesday night, you're going to go, wow, that really makes me think. Okay? And that's what we want. And uh, I know after being a pastor for 30-some years, as I was prepping for China last year, I was learning these things, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, you really should have paid more attention in school. <laughs> and then I realized I never had this course. <laughs> I never had anything like it. Um, in fact, uh, the, the two men who wrote this material are college professors, and uh, it talks a little bit about them in the preface of the book. Now, they always had, uh, and this was the model for, for eons, uh, when you went to college, Bible college, as a freshman, you got the Old Testament survey, and then you took New Testament survey, two separate courses. They were 101 classes. And what these two men did was they saw that there was a, a real void in the uh, students' uh, learning process. And so they created uh, two new courses. One was uh, Bible survey, so not old and new, but Bible survey. One course, Genesis to Revelation, hitting the, the high peaks, right, as it goes through, and trying to look at it from an overview versus more segmented. And then they came to the point they said, we need to be able to teach biblical uh, interpretation, and the, the rules of these things, because this is so important, because it's going to guide these students for the rest of their lives. And uh, I, I don't know, uh, beyond your mastery of the English Bible, I don't know of something that is going to be more beneficial to you than this study, okay? Uh, in other words, reading the Bible, you know, getting familiar with it, knowing where the passages are, especially in the New Testament, that's all very important. But how to actually work through these things, this is going to, to really address those, um, those issues. And so this is pretty exciting stuff, I think, and uh, you're going to enjoy it. Let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to dig right in. All right? Father, we just want to thank you for uh, bringing us together tonight. I thank you for this good group of folks and their desire, Lord, to, to come and to know God's word uh, in a deeper way. And, Lord, I just am uh, thankful that we have people uh, here that want to do that. And Lord, I just pray your blessing on each one of them. Uh, it's just an encouragement, Father, to see, uh, to see folks wanting to know uh, how they can better understand God's Word. And so, Father, may this course truly provide that for them. May it be a fun experience as they learn. And may we all grow together, I pray, in our grace and uh, understanding, Lord, of your Word. And we just thank you, Father, for it all. In Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're here in this interpretive journey, and uh, as I mentioned, don't be afraid to uh, mark things down in your book and uh, make notes. I have my, I have a lot of, uh, a lot of notes. I have a lot of highlights. Uh, I just, I just went through and massively highlighted all the way through. All my highlights have major codes to them, and so, uh, however you want to do it. Uh, just make it, make it out so that it's something that you can hold on to and you can uh, grow from. The interpretive journey, uh, he starts out and he says, A wrinkled old man in the mountains of Ethiopia sips coffee and peers through weathered ancient bifocals at his... And Frank Bottom. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, he is uh, not alone. There's a middle-aged woman. She's bouncing along on a bus in Buenos Aires. Reading and reflecting on Psalm 1, there's a young Korean executive uh, on his way home to Seoul from a business trip to Singapore, flying at 35,000 feet, reading and pondering the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 5. There's a dorm room in San Diego, a young college student polishes off another Mountain Dew and looks back down at her laptop to finish reading Mark's account of how Jesus miraculously calmed a raging storm on the Sea of Galilee. People all over the world love reading God's Word, and that is a true statement. There are people all over the world who are reading God's Word, and they've been doing it now for thousands of years. And we read it, and the key is for us to be able to read it and to be un able to understand it. And you'll notice here, um, he mentioned, he says, some parts of the Bible are easy to understand, but much of it is not. Most Christians, however, desire to understand all of God's Word, not just the easy portions. Many of us want to be able to dig deeper into the Word. We want to see more 
and we want to understand more of the biblical text. We also want to know that we understand the Bible correctly. Now, I'm guessing that's why you're here today. I'm guessing that that's your desire. You want to know the Bible more deeply, and you want to be sure that you're understanding it correctly. What things in the Bible do you find it difficult uh, to understand? There are certain things that are easy to understand. There are other things that are more difficult to understand. What do you, what do you find that's difficult to understand? Prophecy. Yeah. All right, yeah. prophecy. Yeah. Yep. Sometimes parables. Yep. Good. What else? Now, I mean, for me, custom is language barrier. Yeah, okay. That's language barrier. Yeah. What do you find easy as you're reading the Bible? What do you find to be easy to interpret? The gospel message. The gospel message, okay. Ten commandments. Ten commandments. Holy Spirit. Okay. Linking the Old Testament. Yeah. Okay. Bible history. All right. So there's some good things. There's some good things for us to uh, to stop and, and think through. And uh, what we're going to try to do is all these different elements that have just been mentioned. Some are easy. Some are more difficult. But what we want to try to do is give you a method of interpretation that will apply to all the different disciplines of the scripture. No matter what you're looking at, if you're looking at parables, this interpretation process is going to apply. And if you're studying uh, Old Testament law, then it's going to apply. If you're over in Revelation chapter 21, it's going to apply. Are you with me? So what we want to do is we want to be consistent. And I think that that is a, a huge, huge uh, point. So the process of interpreting and grasping the Bible is similar to embarking on a journey, and that's why chapter 2 for you is the interpretive journey. Reading the text thoroughly and carefully lies at the beginning of the journey. From this careful reading, we're able to understand what this passage meant in the biblical context. We very often try to apply the meaning directly to ourselves, don't we, as we're reading Scripture. Because you sit down, why are you reading Scripture? Because you want to apply it to yourself, right? You're reading your devotional, and uh, you're reading your devotional from the book of Proverbs, and you're trying to apply it. And uh, some things may seem like they're easy to apply that day, and other times it's uh, more difficult. The problem for us is that we are separated from the biblical audience by several different things. What types of things separate you and I today, 2018, from... The Jews in the wilderness, or in the wilderness, in the wilderness wandering, okay? I try to cut words like that. It saves time and effort. And then I have to explain it, and so that all the benefit is gone. So the, <laughs> what's, what's some of the differences? Culturally? Culture. culture language. Language. Huge difference. Experience. Experience, Experience yes. Yeah. Especially the way you use English words. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a culture thing right here. <laughs> lack of technology. Okay, lack of technology. We are so dependent on our technology. I mean, even hot and cold running water. Yeah, that's true. That's true. There's a lot of things that we, we don't understand. Um, and so this, this time period that's gone on between them and us <clears throat> creates a a, uh, a true barrier that is, is something that we have to understand. And what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to, to put it into an illustration for us um, so that we would understand that there is a river, basically, that separates us from the text. And it prohibits us sometimes from really grasping the meaning of the text for ourselves. And is there a Bible passage that anyone has um, that you have oftentimes struggled to try to understand, and you're sitting there and go, man, I just wish the Apostle Paul would have written more information about this so that we would understand fully exactly what he's talking about. Is there any, does anybody have one of those passages that sticks out? Maybe it's a Jesus passage. Anything in the book of Acts? <laughs> Passage in the Gospels where Jesus tells his disciples to make things by unrighteous wealth after he tells a parable um, of the shoe manager. Uh huh. Yeah. 
Parable of the shrewd manager, that's a great one. That's a great one. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. We studied that, didn't we, guys? We did. Yeah. Good. All right. Any, anything else? There's, a, there's bound to be passages, though. The significance of three, with three days in the tomb, three days Jonah, et cetera, et cetera, significant from that. I, I just get from yeah. that understand why. Okay. Yeah. We might actually get to a section if we're if we're uh, on the stick. We might be able to get to it. Talks about numerology a little bit, um, the significance of numbers. Yeah. The instruction uh, for women to cover their heads and not speak in church. Okay. Okay. Could have elaborated on that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> You know, here's the thing. There are always going to be things that even though you, you get an A in this course, and there's no test for quickness, so don't worry. But uh, you can ace this thing, memorize this book, and you're still going to have uh, struggles with certain passages, even though you apply the right hermeneutics. Uh, there's certain things that we don't have all the answers to. And uh, God has chosen to reveal exactly what he wanted to reveal. And so we have to keep that in our mind. There's times when I'd just like to have a little more information. But sometimes you, you read through a passage of scripture, and tell me if this is true in your mind. You read through a passage of scripture, and you know that the author of that, that book of scripture is speaking to an audience back then, and you know they knew exactly what he's talking about. And you don't, because we're separated by the culture and situation, years, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, and there's lots of places like that. I think of the Pauline writings in the Thessalonians, um, when you're first and second Thessalonians talking about end times and the rapture and all that, I know those people knew exactly what he was getting at. And it frustrates the daylights out of me that I struggle at times to put all the pieces together. And I think we've done a really good job in being able to search the scriptures out, but it hasn't come naturally and it hasn't come easily to us as it would back in Paul's day. And then you have, what ends up happening is you have diversity among Christians with some of the different views because it's not as clear. Whereas if you know that if you went back to Paul's day and you were back in the first century, that everybody would have been on the same page. There, there wasn't that diversity. Uh, they understood what the meaning was. They understood what the issues were in their church. You know, he writes to the Corinthians, and you know he knew exactly what he was talking about, and they knew exactly what he was meaning as well. They knew people by name who he was referring to in generalities. And we're sitting there trying to piece it all together. Or we have a missing, of, uh, in 2 Corinthians and 1 Corinthians, we have that missing letter, that severe letter that Paul wrote. And uh, we don't have that. We, we, we can surmise what it must have said, and we're trying to figure it out and piece it together. We don't have all the, the pieces. And so uh, there's a lot of things that are going to uh, create a little bit of turmoil for us. We'll get to that. How, how do we handle it? You know, what do, we, what do we do with it? All right, so... The river between the Old Testament text and us consists not only of culture and language, situation, and time, but also of covenant. We have much more in common with the New Testament audience, yet even if the uh, even in the New Testament, the different culture, language, specific situations can present a, a barrier for us. But in the Old Testament, you have the uh, Jewish people who are living under a very different covenant than we, we live today. And so they're under an old covenant, and uh, we, we have a new covenant that's in Christ, right? We have a, a New Testament, uh, and it has changed everything. And so in the Old Testament, they were living under the what? The law. Under the law. And uh, are we living under the law today? No. And so there's always going to be uh, that barrier. So the barrier is, is illustrated by the river. There's a river between... Every single passage of scripture and us today, there's a river. So we have to understand that that river has got to be crossed at some point in order for us to be able to glean the meaning of the passage. So uh, today, uh, because of that barrier, Christians are often uncertain about how to interpret much of the Bible. For instance, and they give the illustration here, Luke, uh, Leviticus 19.19, it prohibits wearing a garment made of two types of material. Does this mean that obedient Christians should wear only 100% cotton clothes? 
In Judges 6.37, Gideon puts out a fleece in order to confirm what God had told him. Does this mean we should out put out fleece when we try to determine God's will in our lives? I mean, is that, is that normative? Is that something that we should do? I mean, check the label on your clothes. If it's not 100%, what, what, what are you doing wearing it? Right? You say, well, wait a minute, Kevin. You, we're not under the law anymore. So how do we interpret that? Because there is definitely a barrier between ourselves and the Jews who received that law. Okay? Well, you can look at that also, the fact that the dietary laws, not only were they a law, but they were a principle which allowed the Jews to have good health because they were eating right things. Mm -hmm. Well, Lindsay Woolsey, for example, which is the two different types of fabric they're referring to, so it's linen and wool combined in the same garment, because they are, one is an animal fiber, one is a protein fiber, they shrink at different, if you wash it, the way the fiber reacts destroys the clothes. Mm -hmm. It has internal vice. Mm -hmm. And so it's a principle that God's giving them, that's helping them in their daily lives. So, I mean, we have to, again, when you're looking at interpretation, you have to look at those kinds of things. What is he addressing in, in the terms of that, that law? And these things all present barriers, and it's all part of that river that we have to cross. In the New Testament, you can go over and you can look at uh, Peter walking on, trying to walk on the water. And is that normative? Is that what we should be doing too? Uh, you know, is that, is that something for, for us to do? So any attempt to interpret and apply the Bible involves us trying to cross this river. And there is a method of interpretation that, that most Christians use. Most Christians use a method that basically employs an intuitive or feels right approach to the interpretation. If the text looks like it could be applied directly, then they attempt to do, apply it directly. And if it can't be applied directly, they spiritualize it. It's okay. very arbitrary, isn't it? It becomes very <laughs> arbitrary. And unfortunately, without any type of, of idea as to how to handle passages, this is how we tend to revert and try to interpret things um, in Scripture. Um, well, I kind of feel like that's for today, or I don't feel like that's for today. We have a lot of cultural things that people today in churches, and I, will, I, will, I don't know this for a fact, but in churches just like our church, we have people who will apply things based upon their notion of culture, okay? And, and, and it, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. So as culture changes, guess what? The Bible doesn't change. Right? The Bible doesn't change. The Bible says it stays the same. And so we have cultural things that we feel good about. It's, it's the way we were raised. It's, it's, it's our lifestyle. And some person puts something before us and says, are you okay with this? And we say, yeah, I feel like that's okay. I've had people say that to me so many times. I'm going back to the 1980s when I remember a friend and, and I remember... Uh, saying to him, we were talking about his church and they were doing something, and I said, yes, but the, the Bible says this. And uh, we were on a fishing trip up in Canada. He was from Canada. And I remember him saying to me, yeah, but he says, I really thought and prayed about it. He says, I feel like this is the right thing. And that's how people are guided in their interpretation of Scripture. And so culture ends up driving how we interpret Scripture. That is not what you're going to learn here in this class this summer. Okay, you're not going to you're not going to learn that at all. What you're going to learn is that God intended a meaning in that passage when He gave it to us, and regardless of what generation we find ourselves living in, there are theological principles with applications that directly come from them that we can draw today in our generation, and guess what? If the Lord tarries a thousand years from now, those same theological principles can be drawn out for that generation, okay? And so we have to be, uh, we, we have to be pretty careful, I think, um, as, as we go about this, because uh, to, to just do the feels right approach can get us into trouble. We do it more than we, we would tend to think. Uh, for instance, um, Oh, rats. Hmm. I have wrong edition. <laughs> it's 
It's on page 390 in mine, but I know it's not going to be there in yours. But let's see if we can find it. to our education in wise living. It's important to see the different roles of each, but we must also be able to see how they integrate together to form the broad literary context of wisdom. As you look at Proverbs, Proverbs lays out a basic approach to life. Now this is, in our, this is going to be in our, our study next summer, all right, when we start to apply the basic tools that we've learned. And I understand that you haven't applied the basic tools yet, because you haven't learned them. So he says there in the notes that Proverbs presents the rational ordered norms of life. The many Proverbs in the book are not universals. When we say universals, they're not always true, but they are norms of life. Are you following with me? They're norms of life. Train up a child in the way he will go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. Is that a guarantee, or is that a norm of life? Well, there are passages of scripture in Proverbs that tell us that if you work hard, you will prosper, and if you don't work hard, you will be poor. All right? Have you ever known someone that didn't work hard who is rich? Oh, yeah. Ever see that TV show where where they're, they won the lottery and they're buying a house. Yeah. You ever see that? Yeah, then the, the realtor's like, well, how much do you want to spend? Well, I, we, you know, we won uh, $10 million, but you know, I don't want to spend any more than $2 million on it, right? And you're looking at these people and you're going, what in the world is wrong with this picture? I mean, because it, it is wrong, right? I mean, you look at Proverbs and you're looking at these people and they're, 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 they're slacking and they get somehow to win the lottery, right? I, I've never won a dime in the lottery, okay? <laughs> Ever, all right? <laughs> And I've never bought a ticket. So I probably, <laughs> never, <laughs> I probably never will, right? Play the win. But I've also known I've also known a lot of hardworking people who are not rich. Have, do you know anybody like that? Oh, yeah. Okay. So so when you look at the universal aspect of proverbs, we have to be very careful because these are norms of life. Normally, we would say if you work hard, you'll be blessed and you'll have enough to get by and, and you'll be able to sustain your living and so forth. And that is a general rule. That is very true. And if you decide in the morning to wake up and not go to work, you'll probably end up being poor. The basic, but there are always going to be tangents that are going to be exceptions to that rule. And this is what he goes on. He says, he picks this up in Job, and he says, the suffering of the righteous. And so Job provides us with an example of someone who is actually righteous, somebody who actually works hard, who actually falls on really difficult times. And you say, yeah, but that's, that's not normative. And it's true. And that's where all the wisdom literature, and I just give that example, kind of pulls these different things together. And is part of that interpretive journey that we go on. Because we're going to look at it, we're going to need to understand, you know, there's a lot to this. These, these books of the wisdom fit together, all right? They fit together. As opposed to, you read Proverbs. How many read Proverbs on a fairly regular basis? I, I would say most of us do. Most of us do. It's a great book of scripture. You can, you can, if you're thinking to yourself, I, I want to do something extra, I want to read something extra, what day is today? Today's the 23rd, let's read the 23rd chapter. 
right? But how do you go about saying this is really applicable and this is really not applicable? Well, it's usually gut instinct, right? And then that is conditioned by all kinds of other outside things. And so we have to be really careful with that as we try to, to go through these things. Not knowing that it fits in with the other books of wisdom uh, can impact us one way or the other and disturb that interpretive journey for us, all right? And so again, let's remember, every single passage we come to, every single one, there is a river to cross. And we've got to figure out how do, how do we get across this river, all right? So let's go on with our, our book and let's look at some of these basics of the journey. Um, <coughs> these are important truths because we need something that's consistent. And uh, he mentions that here on crossing the river. We need a consistent approach that can be used on any passage of the Bible. So we're going to approach every single passage with the same exact consistent approach. That's going to lead us to understand the meaning of the passage and not leave us dangling. And that's really important. What's our goal? What's our goal as we study this? It's to grasp the meaning of the text God intended. That is our goal. Very concise statement. It's under basics of journey, of the journey. Our goal is to grasp the meaning of the text God has indeed intended. We're not creating meaning out of a text. Rather, we seek to find the meaning that's already there. Are you with me? What's the, what's the opposite approach to that? What's the opposite approach to that? What does he mean when he says we do not create meaning out of the text? Surfing for things we like. Okay. Relying on your own wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. Coming to your own conclusion before and, and reading it to support what you already, your presupposition. Oh, good, good. Our presupposition. Our presupposition seems to kill us at times. Now, if our presupposition is part of our systematic theology, and, and it's a systematic theology that's based on the right hermeneutic, there, there can be room for that. But we have to be very, very careful. Presuppositions will usually veil from us a fresh understanding of Scripture. How many times people, how many times people will turn off the teacher when they sit down for the class and the teacher, let, let's just say you come into this Sunday school classroom on Sunday, and the teacher says, all right, turn in your Bibles uh, to Jonah chapter 1, and uh, we're going to talk about Jonah and the whole great fish experience. And you're sitting there thinking to yourself, I already know everything there is to know about Jonah, right? I know everything about Jonah. Oh, what are you going to tell me about Jonah? Oh, I already know about Jonah. He was fleeing off the Tarshish. I get all that. He's out there in the ship. And he volunteers to throw himself overboard. He tells him. And, you know, he sinks down in the water. Fish eats him. Throws him up on him. We, we oftentimes come to Scripture that way. We see it with youth all the time, right? The youth will roll their eyes, you know. Oh, brother, it's another message on the Good Samaritan. Um, but we tend to, to lock out things. And... We tend to do that as well in our own personal Bible reading as we come to passages. We, we'll read stuff over faster, and uh, we won't stop to really look at that as closely as we should. Next week's lesson. Next week's lesson is cool because it's so simplistic. It's almost silly, and yet it rocked my world as a, as a, as a teacher. It just really did. That, it probably stands out to me more than anything. And you're going to laugh because you're going to sit there and think, this is, this is a simple-minded guy. Um, and that's fine. That's fine. I'm just beyond honest with you. I think it's just, it's just, it's so simple you can miss the things that are so simple. And you sit there and shake your head afterwards going, what in the world was I thinking? You know, that is so true. And so I'll challenge you next week. We're going to have fun next week, actually. Make sure you bring a pen and a pad. You're going to need a pen and a pad next week. Even if you didn't bring one tonight, you're going to need one next week. We're going to have fun. All right. Go. So how, do we, how can we recognize that we cannot apply the meaning for the ancient audience directly to us today because of the river that separates us? Well, we need to follow steps that are going to help us to cross this river. And the specifics of a particular passage or what is in view, they may only apply in a particular situation of the biblical audience even. But there are always going to be theological principles that are going to carry over. 
the principles, the theological principle is very, very important because that is going to be the bridge. That's going to be the bridge, the theological principle. Think of it this way. The theological principle has meaning and application to both of the audiences. If both audiences will stand to benefit from a theological principle, and spinning off of that theological principle is application. So that's huge. So here we have an ancient audience, and here we are today. Do we even look alike? I mean, we dress differently, uh, you know, we have glasses. I'm pretty sure they didn't have glasses. I mean, you know, we're very, very different. And yet there's a theological principle that is consistent for both generations. A generation going all the way back to Noah and going all the way to us today, there's a theological principle. And it's the theological principle that is going to be the principalizing bridge. That's what we're going to call it, the principalizing bridge. So let's get to this and uh, let's, let's break it down. Because what I want you to do is I want you to walk away today being able to recite these five steps that we're going to talk about as, uh, as we outline this. First of all, we have an ancient audience that lives in a town, um, and uh, they, might, they might be huts or something like that, little villages. And uh, these people uh, that are living during this time period, as they receive the revelation from God, um, have an entirely different culture, situation, etc., from us today. And so for us today, we're going to find that uh, there is uh, a barrier. Before we get really much further, though, let's talk about the text and grasping the text in their town. That's the first step. What does it mean to the biblical audience? So when you have a passage of scripture and you're trying to understand the passage of scripture, the question you ask yourself is what does it mean to them? So the first part, the first step you want to do, really to take, is to read the text carefully and observe it. You want to see as much as possible in the text. You're going to look and you're going to scrutinize it and study it hard. You're going to look at the historical and the literary context. We'll talk more about where to find information to, to understand literary context and uh, historical context. Uh, I have one whole set of, uh, it's a set of a commentary set that um, it's a little bit, it's kind of a liberal commentary set on some of the theology, and so I don't really tap into the theology at all. But the historical work that the man did, this is an old set, it's an old commentary, but the work that he did on the historical is phenomenal. We'll talk about that. You know, where can I find this information? How can I, how can I dig these these things up? Um, because it is, it is pretty important that we're able to, to to grasp what it means. This Sunday, I'll be speaking in Mark, and Jesus is uh, very busy. Jesus is really, really busy. Uh, he's going to call uh, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and then the next thing you know, he's he's. Uh, teaching in the synagogues, and the people are all blown away by the fact that he's teaching, and uh, then he's healing, and uh, there's a situation with Peter's mother-in-law being sick, and the Bible says that she has the fever, and you and I would think to ourselves, well, fever, well, you know, she got some kind of infection, or, or what, you know, she has the flu, uh, maybe she's got a bad cold, well, it's interesting, it's just a little point, but back in those days, the fever was actually viewed as a disease in itself. It wasn't symptomatic. What does she have? She has the fever. Ooh. She got a toothache, have a fever. But they had no idea. So, so it's interesting. You put yourself back into time. There's all those little nuances of understanding what exactly is being spoken of in Scripture as it pertains to something even as, as small as, you know, what was she ailing from? Okay, Jesus heals her. It's a pretty amazing miracle. 
and she immediately gets up and feels so good that she starts serving them food. I love that mirror. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what she was cooking for, but it must have been pretty good. So, uh, you know, you look back on those types of things and you're trying to define, you know, what does this actually mean as it's applied then? When Mark wrote it, the audience would have understood, oh yeah, she had the fever. You know, she had the fever. Uh, there's other things like that so many times over and over again in scriptures. We don't know oftentimes what is exactly meant by that to that biblical audience. And that's where we need to dig. That's where we need to try to find out all that we can so that we can understand it. So when we complete that study, we synthesize all of uh, the passages that speak to this. We try to put it into perspective so we understand what the biblical audience knew. Um, he says here, he says, write out what the passage meant for that biblical audience and use past tense, past tense verbs and refer to the biblical audience. For example, God commanded the Israelites in Joshua 1 to do what? Paul exhorted the Ephesians to what? Jesus encouraged his disciples by what? Be specific. That's how we grasp the text in their town. We don't try to just gloss over it. How much do we really try to spend time-wise to try to put ourselves in the perspective of the town? When you read scripture, do you really give it much thought? That's why on Sunday morning this past week, I said, I want you all to go back with me to the Jordan River. And pretend that you're standing right there. There comes this man out of Galilee. You don't know who he is. You have no idea who he is. If Jesus came on the scene and there were no miracles done, and he said, come, Leave your fishing nets and follow me. You'd be like, what? I got, a, I got a family to support. I can't be doing that. Oh, well, you know, come and follow me, and, and I will make you fishers of men. Oh, I'm sure that pays well. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but you have to understand what is in their mindset. And so this Sunday morning, when we deal with the call that Jesus makes to Peter and Andrew, it's possible Peter and Andrew were actually there on the Jordan River and heard the voice of God who said, Beloved son, I'm well pleased. I mean, there's something there. Because as soon as Jesus said to them, I want you to leave your, your fishing and become fishers of men, the Bible says they immediately dropped everything and they took off running. They, there was no question about it. And uh, then you come to James and John. James and John is even more definitive because there's their father and the rest of the help. And they were like, yep, yeah, we're gone too. Why would they do that? So you've got to put yourself back in that time frame and understand as much as we can about how they're thinking so that we can apply this better and try to understand what is that theological principle. Step number two is we need to get our rulers out. We need to get our rulers out. We need to measure this river. <coughs> there is, is there always a river? Is there always a river? There is never not a river. There is always, always a river. Some rivers are easy to cross. And some rivers are really hard to cross. I've jumped across many creeks that were four or five feet wide. Sometimes I had to get a running start. Sometimes I threw my backpack, my hunting rifle, I threw it across the other side, made it run down there and jumped across. There are other times when I've had to wear chest waders and have uh, cleats on the bottom of them so that they would grip the rocks and I would walk across with water up to my waist, uh, sometimes 100, 150 feet, hoping I didn't step in a hole and go over my head. It all depends, right? I just never really knew. When you approach the scriptures, there will always be a river that needs to be crossed. And that is because there is cultural differences and so forth because the biblical audience is far removed from you and I today. There will be places that will be very wide. Where are those places in scripture normally found? Where would you find wide rivers? Revelation. <laughs> Revelation? <laughs> Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay. Could you almost always sum it up and say Old Testament, right? Mm -hmm. Old Testament is going to be wider. 
Because remember, they're, they're living under a covenant as well. So not only do you have culture, and they're just farther away from us in, in their cultural thing. There are some, some weird things culturally for us to try to understand in the Old Testament. Can you, can you give me an example? Yeah? Well, the fact that they were worshiping false gods within their culture and what that entailed. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's, it's one thing to say, oh, they're worshiping false god Baal or whatever. Right. But what did that worship entail? Yeah. And so what was their mindset towards those right. gods? Right. Yeah, and there's just all these places. I, I think of uh, the craziness with Lot, you know? I mean, you've got all that going on, and it's like, well, you know, here's my daughter. <laughs> it's just like, what? I mean, seriously, we are so far from that culturally. I mean, I would say, here's my AR-15, okay? It's like, <laughs> you're, you're in trouble. <laughs> I mean, seriously, we are, we are really removed from that. Now, the river is going to be narrower where? In the New Testament, that's right. In the New Testament, it's going to be much narrower. Um, and interestingly, um, there's a whole host of different reasons why it's more difficult to understand the book of Revelation. It's not because there's a lot of culture there. There's not a lot of uh, situation there. It's not as much. Um, in fact, some of that being future, you kind of look at it and kind of can see the handwriting on the wall, and you wonder if we're not... It's starting to merge back a little bit there, and it's becoming easier to understand in some ways. But understand this, that in the New Testament, there will be places where it will not be that wide of a river. Can you give me an example in the New Testament where it's not that wide? Gospels. In the Gospels? Okay. In places, I would say. In places, because there are places and times. Remember when Dr. Bookman was here with us doing the Life of Christ that last week? He's talking about things that, it's like, what? Oh, really? Oh, so Jesus could go this far because he was not under the authority of that wicked leader, so he would stay just outside of that town's <coughs> limits. See, that's understanding it in their town. That's the text in their town, right? And that's things we don't understand, so the river tends to be wider there. I would submit to you that the river is narrowest when the Apostle Paul, for instance, is going through uh, a passage in Ephesians after he's laid out the theology, and he says, be kind one to another. Okay, that, you can step across that, right? I mean, that's not very hard. Uh, we understand that. And so there are the places that you have. So we're going to measure, uh, really measure, the, the differences between their culture and some of those, uh, what, the, what the text meant to them uh, and then for us. So we're going to take a real hard look at this, and we're going to look for significant differences between our situation today and that of the biblical audience. So in the Old Testament, you, you want to note those theological differences, and they are huge. And then we come to the New Testament, and it's, it's very different. So again, stop and think about this. Some see promises that are made to Israel back in the Old Testament and they want to link those with the New Testament church, right? That's a little bit of a problem, isn't it? Because we would say, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, no, no, you can't link that up. And what they're attempting to do is to take scripture here that was appropriate there, and they're going to spiritualize it and bring it right over here. They are ignoring the river, okay? And they're, they're reshaping their theology. You have to be very careful with uh, anything like that. In fact, doing something like that, whether it's British Israelism or whatever it is, Christian Reconstructionism, whatever it might be, that's a very dangerous thing uh, to try to do. Take your Bibles and go with me to, uh, let's look at Joshua 1. So in Joshua chapter 1, Moses has died, the servant of the Lord, and the Lord is speaking to Joshua, and he's telling him that Moses is dead, and he tells him, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people to land I'm giving to you. And then he goes down below in verse 6, he says, be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers. Be strong and very courageous, be careful to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it, uh, from the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. 
This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you'll meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you'll make your way prosperous, and then you'll have, have success. Have I not commanded you? He says again to him, be strong and be courageous. So here in this passage of scripture, the people of Israel are preparing to do what? They're preparing to go into the promised land. Moses has just died. Joshua's been appointed to take his place. In that passage, God speaks to Joshua and basically uh, instructs him how to act and what to do. There are differences for us today. What are the differences between uh, Joshua, as he's hearing from the Lord here, and you and I today? What are the differences? Remember, keep it simple. <laughs> what are the differences? <clears throat> okay, we're, we're not going into the promised land. Okay, all right? We're, we're not going into the promised land. We are not commanded to, to, to go there. All right, that is very true. What else? We don't speak face-to-face like face -face with, -face with God like Moses. That is very true as well. We're not under the old covenant. That is true. We aren't leading a nation. We are leading a nation. We're not leaders of, of Israel. So all of those things that seem very simple, again, it doesn't have to be rocket science. There's differences, major differences there in Joshua chapter 1. Now go to step number 3, crossing the principalizing bridge. When we do this, this step 3 is the most challenging of all the steps because you're looking for a theological principle or principles that are reflected in the meaning of the text. Remember, what we've done is we've looked at, here's the meaning of the text for the village here. Th these people um, would have known what? And so what we would do in that situation is we would put Joshua there, and we would say, okay, uh, Joshua, uh, when God spoke to him, he was to be strong and courageous. Uh, not too wide of a river to follow for that, but he was going to go in and he was going to conquer the promised land. And there's a big difference there for us, isn't there? There's a huge difference for us. And so we want to understand some of the theological principles that Joshua was being instructed in. Okay? Now, God is giving specific expressions to specific biblical audiences. He's also giving universal theological teachings for all of his people through the same text. This is where we need to have some wisdom, and this is going to be, like I said, the most challenging part of this process. So when you go, again, you look at Joshua chapter 1, you can recall the um, differences, but what are some of the similarities? Meditate on God's word. Meditate on God's word. Okay, meditate on God's word. Great. Observe to do all that's written. Okay, we're to obey, meditate. Know that God is with us. Know God is with us. Anything else? Act. Hmm? Act on his word. Act on his word. Strong and courageous. So we would say there are some things that are similar, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's great because now what we've done is we are basically taking a theological principle from this ancient audience and we're understanding the similarities for us today okay we're not to to pick up arms and go into a new promised land all right so we understand how that all works but we are supposed to grab a hold of these eternal theological principles and by doing that what we've done is we've kind of established a base for a bridge on both sides and over here, they come, and for us here, 
they come, and that's going to allow for us to create that bridge, that connector between the two. And that's an important, and that's an important aspect to what we're trying to do as we identify what is the meaning of this text. Now, in your third edition, you have a fourth step that my second edition doesn't have, and that's consult the biblical map. Consult the biblical map. And this simply is uh, saying, how does the theological principle fit with the rest of the Bible? Is it consistent? Now, these are pretty harmless. This is why we're using Joshua chapter 1, because it's very harmless. Uh, obey God. It, that's going to get you brownie points every time. And uh, meditate on God's word. That's, that's fantastic. Who's going to argue about that? Uh, remember that we're comforted by God. R remember that we're supposed to act. Get out there and, and, and do what God's called us to do. And the word to be strong and courageous. Those are all really good principles. Any of those principles outside the orthodox scope of scripture? A any of those uh, outside the biblical map? Anybody have a problem with any of those? No. That's why we use Joshua chapter one. Okay. Because it's very, it's very simple. It's very, it's very uh, forward. So you're looking at it and you're saying, okay, there are things here. So let's understand something. If you're going to teach this passage this Sunday, you said, I've been trying to figure out a lesson. I got it. <laughs> and you're going to do this. Do you believe that as you teach these principles to your audience to obey God, meditate on his word, know that he's comforting you, be strong and courageous, do you believe you're on solid ground? Solid ground theologically. Okay. Have, have, you, have you been consistent with the scripture? You haven't twisted anything. You've been pretty much straight on. And, and even though you're recognizing that it's different for them, because you're not the leader of Israel, you may be a leader in some other capacity in the local church. And some of these principles may directly fit for you. Okay? And you can, you, you can make that leap without you know, doing something that is outside the lines. So always what we're going to do when we develop a theological principle is make certain that the theological principle is consistent with the rest of Scripture. If we come up with something that's just kind of bizarre, we say, well, you know, these guys were supposed to go in there and take the promised land. And I think that what we really need to do is we need to get all the Christians, we need to go down to Texas, and we all take over Texas. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we're going to take over Texas, we're going to have no, no non-Christians in the Texas. Uh, and, or, or maybe it'll be Wyoming. Maybe that'll be easier. But, but you know, we're going to go off and we're going to start our own. And listen, this is how cults get started, right? I mean, there's places up in New York State, this is what they think. And you can go in there and if you pass a test, you could live there in communal living for the rest of your life. You say, well, you know, they, they were going in there to take the land. And if, if God wants us to do it, he'll provide for us just like he provided for them. Uh, you're really on shaky ground, right? <laughs> that, that, that would be a faulty uh, hermeneutic, and it's not going to, to be true across the board with the rest of the scripture. So you need to know that, and that's part of uh, that fourth step. Fifth step here is applying the scripture, right? It's grasping the text in our town. And I tried to draw a more modern town here with steeper roofs. But here we are today in 2018, and we're going to try because we have the opportunity to know these theological principles, we're going to try to figure out how can we apply these, and that's grasping the text in our town. Usually, as you go to a passage, we'll, there will only be a few, and oftentimes only one, theological principle. Or maybe just one theological principle. Sometimes there's a few. This Sunday, there's potentially a few principles in the passage we're going to be looking at in Mark. But as I look at the bigger picture, the message itself, if 
you look at the context, is probably very different from how you've looked at it in the past. Uh, because what we're going to be doing is not camping. Like last Sunday, we didn't camp out on, here's the baptism of Christ, we're going to talk about that all morning. Or here's the temptation in the wilderness, we're going to talk about that all morning. We looked at the different things and we looked at the overall picture. This is what God was doing. He was proving and certifying his son. And uh, this next one, we look at some, some different things as well. There's generally a theological, oftentimes a single theological principle that is being brought forward, even though it may encompass some different passages as almost like sub-points. And in order to discover that, there is a lot of time that has to be spent in the study aspect. That's what you're looking for. You're trying to fit it all together, and you're trying to pull that out. It would have been much simpler for me, as I was going through the passage in Mark, to say, okay, the first section here talks about the baptism of Jesus. And guess what Mark did? He hardly mentions any details. And so let's go to Matthew, let's go to Luke, let's pull all of these other passages together, and let's develop that whole thing. But I'm sitting there thinking to myself, wait a minute, there's a reason why Mark didn't develop all that. There's a reason. It's not like God was just trying to cut a corner. God is trying to teach something. There is a theological principle there that he wants us to get. And if we, if we venture from the, the actual text and try to come up with our own theological principles, i.e., we could look at this over here. We, we've come down here, and I think we've done a pretty, uh, a pretty good job. But, uh, you know, you're the teacher, and you sit there and you think to yourself, well, you know, I, I also think that there's another principle here, and uh, that is you need to be sharing Christ with others. Okay? Is it true we should be sharing Christ with others? Yes. Absolutely. Do you get it out of that passage? Not so much, right? And we hear that all the time. No, we, we hear that all the time. People will just say, well, you know, I think this is a good point. Put it in there. And it, and it just goes against good study, all right? Because when you're trying to interpret the scriptures, it doesn't happen just like that. It takes time to look at the scriptures carefully and seek to develop these different steps as we're going through it. And then always remembering that what we want to do is be totally faithful to the text and not allow our own, you know, well, how many times, you know, I, <coughs> pastor gets up to preach, right? He's going to preach in Joshua chapter 1. But there's been something that's been bugging the daylights out of him. I mean, just been bugging the daylights out of him all week. And it was, somebody said something, and so here it is. It's Joshua chapter 1, but he's going to speak on gossip, okay? He's going to somehow bring that into the message. We have to be very careful with the text. We, we, this is a very... The whole point here is trying to do a very honest approach with the scripture. Uh, there's portions of scripture that talk about gossip. Uh, that's why I like to go through with a text-driven message to go through um, varieties of, of books of the scripture because eventually you touch all these things. And you touch them in the context in which they're given as opposed to trying to, to ride a hobby horse or you know, try to you know, beat a dead horse there with that. Nothing against horses. Um, but you know what I mean. So there's going to be some of these principles. So memorize these five steps. The last one, grasping the text in our town. So that we can understand, here's, here's what it meant to the biblical audience. Um, there to be obedient to the law of Moses, meditating on the law, successful in the conquest. What are the differences? We're not leaders of the nation of Israel. We're not embarking on the conquest of Canaan. We're not under the old covenant of the law. And what is the theological principle in this text? So again, to be effective in serving God and successful in the task to which he's called us, we must draw strength and courage from his presence. We must also be obedient. Those are all theological principles. Now, we're going to go to step four, which is application. Apply the theological principles in their lives. How would you apply these theological principles? Not the one on gospel, because it doesn't belong. But the obedience aspect, or the strong and courageous, uh, the comforted. How would you apply that? Can you give me examples of application? 
Because this is, the, this is the, the fifth point, and that is grasping the text in our town. How do we apply it to us today? If you went back, you'd say, all right, Joshua, this is what you need to do. And we could tell him how to apply what God has said to him. How do we apply it today? You're going to teach this passage this week. How, what are you going to tell the students? What are you going to give them as examples for application? Okay, we're going to rely on God for strength and courage. Now, I'll pick that up a little bit. Go ahead, go for it. <laughs> is that a theological principle or is it an application? Relying on God for strength. You need to rely on God for strength as a theological principle. The application is going to be a little different than that. Okay. Yeah. I would stand on God's word regardless of what anybody would say or think about it. If he tells me not to do something in the Bible scripture, that's what I'm going to do regardless of what anybody thinks or say. Okay. Okay. And, and that's that's getting towards that application, which is good, and it can become a little bit more uh, tapered and a little bit more specific than that. Let's say, for instance, um, you're teaching that class and you want to give application. Maybe there's an application for a, a college student who is um, you know, sparring with the professor over some you know, biblical teaching versus cultural uh, implication. Are you going to stand up and are you going to be uh, undaunted in that? So you can give the application which is a little bit more precise, a little bit more uh, directed, shall I say. So how would, how would you give an application? <clears throat> Any other applications? Let's say we're talking to teenagers, so we'll, we'll kind of kind of Funnel that down. You don't want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're going to talk to teenagers. We're going to give teenagers applications from Joshua chapter one. Could you go by example? <clears throat> okay. Is example a theological principle? That would be the question I would ask. Do we see that theological principle here? If we don't see that theological principle here, then we can't make the application. You don't obey, you're going to ship up to the promised land. Um, not quite what I would have thought, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, could you go back in uh, other texts and show, like where Joshua saw God do things, and you know he was where uh, God was uh, showing strength and like parting the Red Sea and things like that. You know, you, you could, Brian, um, that's going to get into almost a different methodology as far as preaching and teaching. Um, we might say that that's a, a different style of a message as opposed to a text-driven message. So what we want to do here is we want to specifically stick to this text of Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, and we want to figure out what can we apply to today's teenagers that will be consistent because we have a theological principalizing bridge to what was over here. Obey, is it there, as far as obeying, you obey by meditating on God's word, take the time to sit there, critically think and consider about what's being said. Thought in God's word, so you're meditating on it, so you learn it, and by doing so, you're obeying God. That is true. But is that the application that you want to give to a, a young person, okay? It's true, and it can be valuable, but it can be fine-tuned a little bit more to bring out a real-life, I'm looking for real-life scenarios of application. They, um, with, um, with teenagers, um, an application, it has to be real. So uh, this, week, <clears throat> this week, if uh, you see uh, something's gone wrong, school, soccer field, whatever, be strong and courageous. Bring it to someone's attention who's in charge. Uh, you know, just as a simple application of a situation, um, that, that to me is what where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> okay. Give okay. them an example, a real life example in their yeah. lives, not right. mine, but in theirs. <clears throat> that's um, that's that's fair. Todd. <clears throat> not quite there yet. Okay. Go ahead. Um, you, I'm teaching in middle school right now, 
Um, God bless you. When I was, I was, <laughs> I'm a high school teacher, so I was with him this last week, and um, unfortunately, there was this conversation that came up, and there were some of the kids that uh, took something that was said in in the group, and they they realized that there was a filthy interpretation of that. So a couple of them snickered, and one of them just started to laugh, and they looked, and they're making connections, inviting uh, this community of, of laughing at something that's not pure and that doesn't honor the Lord. So in, in my experience for a teenager, being courageous, especially outside of the church, in the, in the school environment, in the community, being courageous would be to put God's uh, view of ourselves and in what he respects above the opinions of my peers and not participate in that. And when someone looks at me and waits for me to laugh or grin, I don't. And, you know, maybe I look sad. To me, that's that's a very practical okay. way of... So, so, so what you've done is basically you've taken a theological principle. The theological principle originated here with Joshua's instruction from God. These noteworthy components are there. We are looking here and we are saying, here are these theological principles that we also can identify with. We can't identify with everything, such as the conquest of, of uh, the promised land, but here are some things we can't. That's the principalizing bridge. What this means then for us today is in reality how we're applying it. So we're saying to the kids, we're saying, okay, you need to stand up and, and hold on to what is right and uh, you know, go against the flow when, when others are mocking and others are doing those kind of things. So what we've done is we've basically taken a theological principle and spun off of that theological principle application. All right, and it's very, very important. I would just encourage you too, if you have kids and uh, your kids are trying to, to figure out, you know, what is my belief system and, and what am I going to follow and so forth, you want to stick with uh, correct interpretation of the scriptures. Because if you start throwing some things in, well, you know, over there in Joshua chapter 1, you know, uh, that, that's about lying, right? And you need to, you can't, you, the kids are uh, able to process that and they're able to, um, uh, they're, they're able to apply, okay? Let me shift gears on you. I know a couple of you have your hand up. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm up against I want you to do something a little differently right now. I want you to give me application if you were doing the rest home miss, missionary or rest home ministry this week and uh, you were in Joshua chapter 1. What would your application look like for folks at the, the rest home? Yes? I just read Joshua 1 right here. Yeah. And it says that they saw you, so that you, uh, you, you can uh, be carefully to do everything. Yeah. Yeah. Carefully to do everything. That's right. And and it, this was very important for Joshua. Joshua was going to have to follow in very minute detail everything that God was telling him to do in order to be successful. That's the same, that's a principle that does uh, add to the theological uh, principles of the principalizing bridge, okay? But how would we apply this a little bit differently for a rest home ministry? It's dealing with, you know, trusting God and the fear of the unknown and willing to support them just knowing that God would choose to use these leaders for Okay. So different different application, same theological principle, and what you've done is you've stayed true to the text. You have not stepped out of the lines of the text in trying to apply this. Okay? So this is going to be the journey that we're going to take, and we're going to go through this journey of observing these five steps and then we're going to eventually, by next summer, we're going to take these uh, whole sections of scripture and we're going to say, well, how do we apply these five steps to the book of Psalms? How do we apply these five steps to this? How do we do this? And so it, it helps us as students of the word to be able to, to mine the truth out and understand more completely what is going on. So next week when we come together, uh, we're going to have a lot of fun because we're going to be looking at some things uh, uh, that are going to, it's going to help us get to this point. And so uh, there's, I think, the next three chapters in your book actually help us with determining uh, the, the 
biblical audience's understanding of that passage of scripture. Okay? So hopefully that'll that'll help us. Any, any questions up to this point, Dave? Yeah, um, when I went through this passage, uh, just as a principle, okay, you know, he says, follow my word once, but he says, be strong and courageous at least three times. Yeah. I mean, he's obviously emphasizing that principle over some others that he's perhaps giving. So, so yep. is, am I getting ahead of our So, so great, great observation, and come back next week because that's part of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right on, right on, absolutely. Okay, any other questions? I wonder how, how should we prepare for next week other yeah, than memorizing the five? Uh, so, so next week, you don't, you don't have to jump ahead, read the chapter ahead. You don't have to do that. Um, actually, I would focus back rather than forward. Focus on what we covered tonight. Look at those five steps. Think it through. Maybe you'd like to do some exercises. I think um, uh, in the book here, there are some assignments um, that you can do. If you bought the workbook, uh, there's assignments in there that you can do. Maybe you want to just, uh, if you're in a regular reading pattern of scripture, hopefully you are, take tomorrow's passage and apply the five steps and, and see where that leads you. I think what will happen is that you will have an appetite for determining what the meaning of the text was to the biblical audience. Uh, and that's something maybe, I just challenge you, maybe you haven't stopped to think that much about that. Um, we, we tend to, to skip over that. But it's an essential part of our understanding of the passage. So you can do that. All right. Let's have a word of prayer and uh, let you go here tonight. Father, we just thank you so much for your word, Lord. Um, it, it, it means everything to us. And Lord, uh, we thank you that the, the word of God is uh, truly a supernatural book. And it's something worthy of our study. So help us, Father, as uh, we embark on this journey, uh, Lord, to, to learn and to be able to uh, really magnify uh, the time that we spend in the Word of God. Bless each one, Lord. Give us just a great rest of the week, I pray now. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. What's that?